It's just the birthday of the Rebbe Rashab, the three Rike Rebbe's father and the son of the Rebbe Marash. Rabbi Tzakani suggested that we use the, this few minutes to talk about the Rebbe Rashab's life. Now, obviously, we're not going to discuss his whole life, so I'm going to talk, uh, share certain events in the life of the Rebbe Nishma Sayyidin, which I hope will, uh, will be meaningful to you. And um, as the old expression is like Hamedre Shikirela Hamaisa, the most important thing is the stories. Hamaisa who are you Before the Rebbe Rashab Bar Mitzvah, his father told him that it was meant to be a Rebbe. Before the Rebbe Rashab Bar Mitzvah, his father told him it was meant to be a Rebbe. And he told this over to the Fiyarik Rebbe. He said at that point, a, a, a jolt of pain shot up his back from his, from his waist to his shoulder. And he said, the pain from that jolt, from the sense of responsibility of being a Nasi, never left him. He suffered with that pain his entire life. And then he told the Friedrich Rebbe, when my father told me that I'm going to be a Rebbe, a Nasi be a soul, I asked myself, what should I do? And I came to the conclusion that I have to work on myself. Now, as the Rebbe said many times, Mir Kleiber sich nicht von Nander von ein Anok, lagabe ja zweit Anok. When you compare a Rebbe to a Rebbe, it's impossible, it's impossible to, to, uh, to juxtapose one Rebbe against another. Each Rebbe is an Atzmi. That means his whole life radiates from the deepest levels of his Neshama. Each one of them is very individual. And each one of them is a Lukus, Kedish HaKadosh. But at least from what we know, you, you look at that Abayim, I, I say this to people all the time, you have to do Word association, yeah? You say Baal Shem Tev. So I've had years and years to think about it. You say Baal Shem Tev, you say love. You say Mizit Magid, you say Tzadik. You say Alter Rebbe, you say Moyach, brain. You say Mitle Rebbe, you say holy. <laughs> you say Tzamach Tzadik, you say gigantic. You say the Rebbe Marash, you say Lechat Chil Ariber. And you say the Rebbe Rashab, you say Avoida. You say the Friedrich Rebbe, you say Mesir Snefesh. You say the Rebbe, you say either Maise or Mashiach. But when you say the Rebbe Rashab, again, this is just my opinion. If you had to give one word labels for each one of the Rebbe, and based on what we know, by the Rebbe Rashab, you would say the word Avoida. He was a Jew who even as a Rebbe, but certainly before he became a Rebbe, he's Avoid the Pratis Im Atzmai. The way he squeezed himself his avoidance Hashem should be the shame shamayim. It should be emes. It should be the sake of God and God alone. It should be emes. It's painful. It's much painful to read. How much he exhausted himself and he pushed himself that everything should be emes la'amite. And we know for a fact that this drive for emes of the Rebbe Rashab was such a big burden on him that it pushed, made him physically sick. We know it's a very, very interesting thing that this was revealed to us. The Friedrich Rebbe told it to the Rebbe in private. And the Friedrich Rebbe revealed it to the Lukut the Buddha, and then the Rebbe revealed it here in America that the Rebbe Rashab went to see Freud, Sigmund Freud, in the, the, the winter and spring of 1902-1903 because of his own Agmas Nefesh, because of his own inner pain, which was a symptom of his avoida, of the life that he'd undertake. Uh, now, the Rebbe needs Sigmund Freud, or Sigmund Freud needs the Rebbe, this is a bazun de Maise. But the fact is, in Das Tachten, the Rebbe Rashab had such stress, and the stress is worth to a very, very great extent. What the Rebbe Rashab demanded of himself, we don't know by other Rabbeim this kind of avoid. I'm sure it was, but we don't know about it. The thing about the Rebbe Rashab, which sort of lends to it, he became a Rebbe very young. No Rebbe was even close. The Rebbe Rashab became a Rebbe. He was less than 22. The Rebbe Marash became a Rebbe. He was already in his 30s. All the other Rebbe were either in their late 30s or 40 or already in their 40s. The Rebbe became a Rebbe was almost 50. The Rebbe Rashab became a Rebbe 21 years, 10 months and 3 weeks and one day. And the stress of that early Nisias exhausted him. We know for a fact that twice over the course of a 10 or 11 year span, the Rebbe Rashab almost pushed it, passed away from illnesses 
that were clearly, again, I, I'm telling you how I understand it. It doesn't say this explicitly, but it's very implicit, what they call in America psychosomatic. In other words, physical illnesses that came from emotional pain. The Rebbe had started to in Memvav Memzayin, 1886, 87, when the Fidei Rebbe was six and seven. His father was near death, and he wrote a Tzavor, Chaneich Lenar, which is now printed, where he instructs the Rebbe Tzinifke, the Rebbe Tzinifke, the Rebbe Tzinifke, the mother, how she should raise him in case Chas V'Shalom, there's not going to be a Rechaz Yomim by the Rebbe Rashab. And then again in Reish Nanala, a few years after that, in 1890-91, the Rebbe Rashab was very, very, very ill. And there's a beautiful story how the Friedi Rebbe got up in the morning and he said he hadn't seen his father, he hadn't seen his father living in the house in three months. And he went for talk to the Oyel based on instructions from his Malamid. And when he came back, right away, as soon as he walked into the house, Friedi Rebbe was 10 years old. He felt that the mood was different. And they told him that the Rebbe Rashab Sakona passed. In other words, the Friedrich Rebbe as a 10 year old went to the scene of the Rebbe Marash and the Rebbe the Tzedek. Before he came back to the house, his father was already feeling better. But then the Rebbe Rashab became a Rebbe. The Nusach is that the year of Avelis plus 10 years, that's 11 years, the year of Avelis was on Yugimel Tishrei Tafresh Mem Gimel. To your Gimel Tisha Tafresh Mandalit, and then that means 1882-83 until 1883-84, and then until Rosh Hashanah Rish Nundal, which is 1893-94, the Rebbe Rashab's Nesias was precarious. He said Chsidis, but he was away a lot, and when he was away, he didn't say Chsidis. Yechidis was intermittent, sometimes there was Yechidis, sometimes there wasn't Yechidis, sometimes there was Yechidis only for men and not for women, and so on. And also the uh, Fabrengen mission were intermittent. But the Rikir is, I understand that Askana Saklau was something that the Rebbe Rashad did not really take on. All the Lubavitcher Rabbeim <coughs> saw themselves as responsible for the Jewish people in Russia, not necessarily Chesidim, not even necessarily from people. And all the Rabbeim, each one in his own way, was deeply, deeply involved in looking after the cause of the Jewish people in Russia. I mean, the Friedrich Rebbe and the Rebbe in America, there were no borders, you know, a Rebbe without borders. He was literally the Rebbe of every Jew in the world. But in those days, until the Friedrich Rebbe left Russia, you know, as they called it, Medina Seinu, the Rebbeim, Begoloi, on an hour level, they were the Nesim, the Rebbeim of the Yidin living in Russia. And the Rebbe always says that at the time that the Rebbeim lived in Russia, Raiv Minyan and Raiv Binyan of Bnei Yisrael was in Medina Seinu. That means the biggest body and the greatest force of Jews any place in the world, the Rebbe writes and says many times, was in Russia. And the Rebbeim were Askana, you see, but they're very involved in public service. There were different styles. The Marshal, the Rebbe Marash did it himself. The Rebbe Marash was a traveler. The Marash was, in quotes, very modern. He spoke many languages. And he was very worldly in his way. He was an Isha Lakim Kaddish, but nevertheless, he was very worldly. And he did a lot of Askanas in a very overt way. The Tzemach Tzedek style was covert. Tzemach Tzedek gave the impression that he was a big battle and didn't know what was going on. And the Misnagdim, the, the reformers, in the times of the Tzemach Tzedek, they were no longer Misnagdim. But the reformers used to say about the Tzemach Tzedek, as long as you leave him alone, you can do whatever you want. He doesn't know what's flying. The fact was that while they were saying this about the Tzemach Tzedek, the Tzemach Tzedek was running circles around them through people who helped him, including the Rebbe Marash. The Rebbe Marash was the leader of the Jewish people in Russia. His Nesias was very difficult. But when he was nostalgic, at least the way I see it, from, and I heard this from my friends who know these things, that the Rebbe Rashad did not take on the Eskonos right away. There was a Yid in Russia, his name was a Yitzhak al a Spectre. He was a Litvish Sharab, the Kovner Rab, who was a very big god. He worked a lot with the Rebbe Marash. But when the Rebbe Marash was alive, the Rebbe Marash was the leader of the Eskonos. The Rebbe Rashad held, and he, he think he wrote letters to this effect, that as long as the Kovner Rav was alive, I was able to let him do the Askonas, and I was able to do my own thing. The Bidikhan passed away in the mid 1890s, Tafresh and Hei, Resh and Vov. His son was Mamale Makaymah, the Kovner Rav, the Bidikhan's son took over his position. And the Rebbe Rashab saw right away that it's not the same thing anymore. And the Rebbe Rashab became very involved in Askonas, and he became ultimately the leader of Russian Jewry, certainly Chsidim in Russia. So in Rosh Hashanah, 1892 94 the Rebbe Rashab walked into Shul, this is the story. And he walked over to his father's shtender, into his father's seat, and he sat down. That was the official announcement 
Mirab Mareb. You know, all the time until then, the attitude was the Rebbe was being on of Ye Rebbe, Nisht Rebbe. A lot of people left Lubavitch. But the Rish Hashanah, Rish Nadal, Rebbe walked into the shul. He sat down in his father's seat. And from that point forward, the Rebbe was officially a Rebbe. And again, it's very difficult to know how these things developed. But over the next few years, the Rebbe Rasha became a bigger and bigger Rebbe. A bigger and bigger Rebbe has many connotations. One of them is, he pushed on more and more chassidim. Labavitch was almost drained. Labavitch was almost drained. Because Chabad had four branches. It's hard for you guys to even understand. It's hard for me to understand it. Chabad had four branches. The Mosaddik's four sons became Rebbe. The biggest of the four branches of Chabad was Kopus. And the Kopus that Rebbe didn't pass away until 1900, the Tafresh Sama. The Kopus that Rebbe got most of the Chassidim, but the Tafresh passed away. And when the Rebbe Marash passed away, a lot of Labavitch Chassidim left Labavitch and went to Kopus because they, they were saying there's no Rebbe in Labavitch. The Rebbe Rashab was headed to be Rebbe. So in other words, even those people who stayed in Labavitch after the Tzedek Tzedek passed away, after the Rebbe Marash passed away, a lot of them would leave. And then there was the second biggest was Liadi, the third biggest was Nezhen, and the smallest, literally the smallest of the four branches of Chassidus was Lubavitch. And when the Rebbe Rashab hesitated to become a Rebbe, a lot of the people who had an association with Lubavitch also, so to speak, distanced themselves. One of the features that always existed in Lubavitch, which the Rebbe Rashab participated in, was called the Yoishvim. Zitzers. Literally sitters. Lubavitch did not have a yeshiva. But while in Russia, it wasn't like today. There was no such thing as a Litvish yeshiva. <laughs> a Mesnagdish yeshiva. It was a yeshiva. Yeshivas taught you lambdas, gemara with mafarshim, and they had no shita. Yeshivas didn't tell you, this is a godl, this is a godl, we teach you Torah, and that's it. All of the chassidim in Russia, sent their children to the yeshivas, and Yom Tif time, all the chassidim shabachim, and half the chassidim, litva shabachim, would go to the various rebbes in Russia, either because they were mamash chassidim, or because they were curious. But the yeshivas were really not, uh, leaning the Bacharim away from Chassidus Faket, a lot of the Litvish yeshivas were full of Chassidus Bacharim. Labavish didn't have yeshiva till Tem Chatmimim. So they were young alike, become Midech Achamim. Some of them learned at home, Pasha. Some of them were the sons of Rabbonim, and they learned at home. You have to remember in Russia in those days, the, every Rav, every single Rav in his shtetl or Shtat was also the Rosh Yeshiva. Every Rav in every city was a big Tamat Chacham, not like today, a real Goan. And they were the young alike, the kids who stayed to learn after Bar Mitzvah, the Rav was officially their teacher. And he would come in every day and give a shir and talk to them and learning. The better Bacharim went away to the big yeshivas. But Lubavitch did not have a yeshiva. What they had was an elder Bacharim, Bacharim who were already grown up, they were very learned, or even younger like young marrieds, would come to Lubavitch. Some came with their wives, some came alone, some were still single. And they would spend time in Lubavitch. Some spent six months, some spent a year, some spent two years. The purpose, and they would live in Lubavitch, they paid rent, they took a room in somebody's house, room and board, and they would, they have, the purpose of coming to Lubavitch was, these were very learned young alike, big Hamidiyah HaChomen, they were the Rabbonim all over Russia, but they were Lubavitchers. And they didn't get Hadrocha in Darche Achsides. In other words, in Yeshiva they learned how to learn. But avoid us Hashem, that Chassidus teaches, they didn't learn in the Yeshivas. So not, children didn't do this, it was only grown men who were already quite learned, they would come to Lubavitch, and they would sit in Lubavitch. And the Rebbe, the Rebbe was busy with these Yoishvim. Sometimes there were five, sometimes there were ten, sometimes there were twenty. It was never five hundred, it was a few people. And these younger light were very bright. And when the Rebbe said, I see this, so sometimes there were more people, sometimes there were fewer people. But the Yoishvim would sit, they would hear the Maimon, and then they would chazit it over and over again, they would write it down. And by each one of the Rabbeim, there were different rules that these young alike, the Yoishim had a right to go into the Rebbe after the Rebbe said a Maimir until a certain point and ask him for Pshat. So when the Rebbe Rashab was a young Rebbe yet, even though officially he wasn't a Rebbe, they were already Yoishim. And the Firk Rebbe and his Nishimis write some of their names. And these Yoishim, they were the ones who, so to speak, drew out of the Rebbe Rashab that he should say, see this. And some of these Yoishim also wrote the Hanochas. The Rebbe Rashab didn't necessarily write all of his Maimorim. These Yoishim 
used to also write down the transcripts. A lot of my modern we have from the Rebbe Rashab, especially in the early years, that we don't have a Maimon and Ksav, the Rebbe Rashab didn't write it himself. We have it from these various different Yungalite that were sitting in Lubavitch as Yosh. When the Rebbe Rashab made Tem Khatmimim, he made the Yeshiva overnight. The first ten Bacha of Tem Khatmimim were these Yoshim. They were already in Lubavitch. They were there for the purposes of getting Hadrach and Lima Dachsidis. And the Rebbe just, when he made Yeshiva, they, they so to speak automatically, they became the first Talmidim of Yeshiva's Tem Khatmimim, Yeshiva's Tem Khatmimim started. So one way Lubavitch got bigger is that when the Rebbe became officially the Rebbe. So first of all, it's really weird. He became healthier. When the Rebbe Rashab was younger, between the age of 22 until 33, he was very sick. And then he became healthier. He passed away at 59. He didn't have a very long life. And his goof was exhausted. His goof was exhausted from Avoida. His goof was exhausted from Tzadis. Tzadis Akal was a very hard leadership, hard to see us. But his... His period of maximum ailment when he was the youngest, between the age of 22, 22 until 32, Berach, he was sick a lot. He became healthier. He was around more. He didn't disappear from the Babich for months at a time. He said chesidus. So people started to come. People started to come. And uh, there was this week an increase in koch in the Babich. Um, the Rebbe Rashab, my modem, even in the very early years, were outstanding, meaning to say, when you compare them to the Chabad of other Rebbes, and Allah has come of a Kama, when you compare them to his competition, you know, the other Chabad movements, the Rebbe Rashab Maimorim are written so lucidly, so clearly. The Rebbe Rashab said, but here's Maimorim, my Maimorim, you don't have to learn. I learned them for you, you have to read them. Then in your letter, I, I, they're pre-learned. And it's true, if you ever learn from the Rebbe Rashab, they're written incredibly easy to learn. The Rebbe Rashab doesn't leave a stone unturned. He answers every question, everything that he starts, he finishes. And he was a magnet. People started to come. And Lubavitch began to grow from that. The Fiyidi Rebbe says that when Tevchat Mimim was established, and there were a number of different things that began to happen. The Rebbe Rashab started writing letters. Barnoni Avoido. If you have, there's a Kuntis called Kuntis Omayan. In the beginning of Kuntis Omayan, there's a very, very long introduction. I don't know if it's translated into English. Where the Fidik Ebbet describes how Lubavitch Chassidim all over Russia were writing letters to Lubavitch with tightness. The Rebbe is saying Chassidus, the Rebbe is writing letters, the Rebbe is opening up the world of Chabad Chassidus. Why are you keeping a secret from us? The Rebbe Rashab, from the time he became a Rebbe, began to develop the community of Chabad Chassidim and the learning of Chassidus. And the Ikir is the davening, the Chabad. There was no telephone, there was no communication, it was letters. And the Rebbe wrote a, the Rebbe wrote a famous letter about Avodah Sashem. They wrote the Kuntus Amaya. It had to be copied. So the different communities of Anas said, you have to send it to us. We're Lubavitch Achsidim. We don't know what's going on in Lubavitch. You know we don't know. Loma Nigoda. You can't keep a secret. That was the word. And the Rebbe Rashab began to develop the community of Chabad Chassidim very, very, very strongly. And he was doing it very successfully. And Lubavitch began to grow. Lubavitch began to grow. The community of Lubavitch Achsidim began to grow. Just... While on the subject, even though this is not chronologically consistent, after World War I, which ended in Russia in 1917, there was a renewal of this, right? The World War I was a cataclysm. It was very destructive to Russia. The Russians made a separate peace with the, the Germans, as you know, before the armistice, because of communism. And when they made their separate peace, Russia was quiet for a while. And the Rebbe Rashab went on a big campaign that in every city there should be a Tomim, there should be one person <coughs> whose job it was to see to it that uh, Friday night they should learn to put a tere. Shabbos Mavarchem, there should be a Fabrengen. Matzah Shabbos, there should be a Malava Malke. And the Chassidim should learn Chassidim, like it says in the Yem Yem. Stam Chassidim three times a week, which means Monday, Thursday, and Shabbos. And Tmimim every day. These were all parts of the, of the efforts that the Rebbe Rashab made in strengthening Lubavitch. So in the beginning, people looked at Lubavitch as they still their mom and pop chassidus. But over time, especially when the Kapasta passed away, and then much later on, the idea passed away, in other words, the two competing Rebbes, the two big Rebbes. So Lubavitch, by default, became bigger. A lot of chassidish people who had belonged to the other movements fell into Lubavitch by the virtue of the fact that it was pushed. There, there were other places to go, but the, the Rebbe Rashab was 
Mashem, the Ebed Shabbat was a personality. And again, when you met that Ebed Hashab, when you looked at that Ebed Hashab, when you learned from that Ebed Hashab, what you felt was everything has avoided. Everything has avoided. Everything has avoided. Satsila. Davening, 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 davening. And it's odd. It's really very odd. No Rebbe's my modem are more interesting. <laughs> no Rebbe's my modem are more philosophical and mystical and, and logical. Seicheldik. And when you read his my modem, and then you read his letters and his sikhas, and you read his biography, you see... Such a huge duality here. This was a person who every breath was Avodah Hashem. And his chassidus is so beautiful. It's so not heavy. It's so delightful. And to juxtapose that this person wrote these maimonim is, is a fascinating thing to contemplate and to become aware of. And of course, the biggest change that took place in Lubavitch was Tev Chetmina. The Rebbe Rashab made the yeshiva. And as soon as the Rebbe made the yeshiva, all the Lubavitch chassidim in Russia, I want to say that again, all the Chabad chassidim in Russia, that means Nezhin and Liadi and Kopost and Retzitze and Babroisk, they sent their children to Lubavitch. They sent their children to Lubavitch. In other words, until then, they were learning in, in Navardek and Slabotka and the Baranovich and, and the, um, you know, the Litvish yeshivas, uh, Mir. But if there was going to be a chassidish yeshiva, even if it wasn't their persuasion, exactly, they sent their children to learn in Lubavitch. And many of them became Lubavitch Chassidim because they were learning in Tempe Pimim and Lubavitch. Um, this is one, so to speak, part of how the Rebbe Rashab's Nesias developed. And the Fidik Rebbe says something fascinating. If you look at the Maimorim of my father, you could understand the level of the Talmidim in Tempe Pimim. The Rebbe Rashab was a teacher. You know, when we were growing up, our mashpim used to say this all the time. It made me nervous then, it makes me nervous now, but <laughs> the, the, it's, the, it's true. The, the three Rebbes, the Rebbe Rashab was a Rav to Talmidim. The Fiyidik Rebbe was an Av to Bonim. And the Rebbe is a Melech to Anam. The Rebbe Rashab was a teacher to students. The Fiyidik Rebbe was a father to children. And the Rebbe is a king to subjects. And then they say further that the first 10 years the Rebbe was an Av to children. The second 10 years, there was an Av to Bonim. And the third 10 years, there was a Melech to Av. These are all Der Shire Shumas, Vesel Mashpim, talk about these things. These things. The last 10 years, was a Melech. A a king. The last 20 years. I don't like these things because I think only a Rebbe is entitled to interpret what's going on by a Rebbe, but you can see it. The Fiyidik Rebbe said, My father said my modern based on the level of the Bach. In fact, when there were very good Bacham in the yeshiva, there was a certain Tommen. His name was Avram David, David Pevzner. Not to be confused with Avram Baruch Pevzner. We have over here Av, Avram, Avi Pe, Avram Baruch. He's Avram Baruch. There was Avram David. Avram Baruch was a big chassid, but Avram David was a malach. Mr. All the Pevzner are related. There was a, we're also, I'm also Pevzner. <laughs> Half Lubavitches. Posner, Pevzner, Salte Mishpacha. The Alter Rebbe's brother, Mordechai, was Pevzner. And we're all his descendants. So I'm Estama, they were cousins. But the Rav David was a was a, a, a Moedenik person. He passed away at 34 years old. And the Rebbe Rashi's Avoidah was not from this world. And the Rebbe Rashab, the Rebbe Rashab allowed him to do an Avoidah which, which shortened his life. And, and the Rebbe understood exactly what this is. The Rav David Pevner is the only Tomim, the Fidik Rebbe writes about him, Harav, HaTomim, HaTalmid Muvuk. He calls him a Tal, he calls him a Talmid of the Rebbe Rashab. It's the only place even Chanyim Arozov, it doesn't say Talmud, it says Talmud. Avram David was called the Rebbe Rashab's Talmud. When he was in Chavimim, the Rebbe Rashab did not write many of his Maimorim, because he pushed trust in his Anochas. And as he understood so deep and he understood so deep and he wrote so well, the Samach, Samachal, Samachal, you could see there's a lot of Maimorim. The earliest years, Samach, 1900, 1901, 1902, you look in the Svarim, you'll see there's a lot of Anochas. Those Anochas are from David's Anochas. The Rebbe Rashab was from Palos. The Rebbe Rashab trusted him. And what's even cuter, you look in some of those Hanochas, the apprentices, Omer B'Sha'as HaChazorim. They write a Hanochah V'Maimit, and then the next morning they would go into the Rebbe Rashab V'Chazorim, and he would write, B'Sha'as HaChazorim, the Rebbe added Kach V'Kach, Omer B'Sha'as HaChazorim. And all of this built up, it made Lubavitch very, very big and very, very respectable. Understand that that's not the Lubavitch of today. <laughs> Because the Lubavitch that the Rebbe Rashab rebuilt was destroyed by Stalin. I mean, it's so many times 
You know, the Rabbeim put Koichas in, they create a whole new community, and it was a large, robust community. In other words, in many cities in Russia, you had hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who considered themselves Chassidic Chabad, who learned Chassidus, who davened Ba'ad Yichis, who thought Peter Shamilis, who worried about Machshav You're not talking about one or two people. And you're not talking only about Bachrim. It was a creation of a whole community. And then the Bolshevik Revolution happened. All of these things fell apart again. And then they're about to build a new army. That's how these things go. It happens again and again and again. Anyway, this is one area of, of, of the development of Lubavitch. And like the Rebbe said, he says that from the years, that from the years, Samach Vov till I am bathed, you could see, you look at the Maimonim and you can understand the Madreg of the Bochrim. When the Rebbe Rashab said the Maimonim of I am bathed, which is the deepest and the hardest and the most beautiful Maimonim, you have to say that at that point, the Tmimim were the highest Madreg. In other words, even though the, early, the earliest Tmimim, some of them were very bright, but apparently in terms of development of understanding Chesidus, there was a, re- a gradual growth. This is one area. And the other area is Askonis, that Eben Ashab got involved in uh, public service. And uh, how exactly these things would evolve is hard to know. How exactly these things evolved is very hard to know. But over the course of years, not that many years, the Rebbe Rashad became very involved in Askonis Tiburis. He became very, very involved in the leadership of Jewish, Judaism in Russia. And it's a story. The Rebbe Rashad Askonis is a story. It has many parts. He did many different things. And uh, he led. He organized many times to help Yidin Lamashal. During 1905, there was a war between Russia and Japan. The Rebbe Rashab made sure that all the soldiers that were Jewish had matzahs and kosher food and svarim. And whenever there was a need, an acute need, the Rebbe Rashab saw it as his business to look after people and things. So a part of the Askon, as part of the leadership, was Pasha to deal with the government. Russians, Bechlau, were big anti-Semites. And they are Slavs, they're anti-Semites. Russians, Poles, they're anti-Semitic. Bechlau Europeans... <laughs> I'm very happy to be in America and I don't know how to tell you this. Uh, Europeans are anti-Semitic, but the Slavs particularly. And in Russia, it was especially sinister because the Russian government used to use anti-Semitism as a, as a ploy to stop unrest. You know, Russia was a serfdom. Russia was a country of class. Yeah, two or three percent of the people who were very, very, very rich, they were called the nobility, they were the royalty, his system related to the Mishpacha. And everybody else was literally indentured. They, they had lived on the land, which didn't belong to them. They were always paying back debts with 25% interest, which meant for the rest, they were slaves till the day they died. You know, they were very happy to give you a loan. And the, the interest terms were impossible to pay back. So for your whole life, you were paying a debt. So you couldn't leave your land. And then when industry started, that means, you know, something happened in America. Industry means factories moving to the big cities, the assembly line, and people were getting hurt. People were getting hurt. You know, machines would break and... People would burn themselves and lose limbs. And there was absolutely no Rachmanes. You know, the big people make more the money, really didn't care two hoots about the lesser class. And from time to time, it became so bad that the people would rebel, people would rise up. And the government of Russia, the Tsarist government of Russia, had to, quiet, had to quench these rebellions. I mean, there's famous stories where literally the palace of the king was attacked by a mob of thousands of people who push and hungry for bread. And the soldiers stood in front of the palace and mowed them down like they cut grass. They shot them like, like nothing, like chickens. Um, so the Russian government used anti-Semitism as a distraction. They'd fill the newspapers with anti-Semitic rhetoric. So the Goyim would start to think about the Jews and how everything is the Jews' fault. And they'd forget about the fact that their own government was the reason they were hungry and starving. And when the pogroms would happen, the government would start cooking. They wouldn't arrest people. They wouldn't punish people. So the pogroms were open season. Every one of the Rabbeim dreaded it. The dealt with it. The Marash dealt with it. The Rebbe Rashab dealt with it. In, in 1922, which during the time of the Fiedek of Messias, they found films. They found movies. I have a movie in my house where you see Jews just laying on the ground, slaughtered. They had to get. In some place, they killed 100. This was a, regu- it was a regular part of life. Every few years, there's pogroms. In big cities, in small cities. Huh? They had a code to spread it in the newspaper because they weren't straight up a lot of right pogrom. They write candlelighting in this place. Oh, how, how the government would communicate it. But the point is that the, the government was behind it. 
and it made it very, very difficult to combat. And the Rabbeim had to deal with this. And the Rebbe Rashad, the Fidika, I mean, his stories. The Rebbe told the story that the Fidika once walked into an office, one of the most important people in all of Russia. And on his desk was sitting a Gzeir Han Yidin. He walked into the building, didn't ask any questions, walked straight into that guy's office, didn't ask any questions, found the Gazeta, tore up a little piece of threw it in the garbage and walked out. He could have lost his life. He Pasha could have lost his life. The Chassidim came to the Rebbe Rashab and said, you can't gamble with your son's life like this. And the Rebbe Rashab said, no, no, it's good. But this was, I mean, the Rebbe told us, imagine walking into the CIA building, just walking into the, the, you know, the secretary of the CIA, go, finding a paper, tearing up, putting it up, and just walking out the building. Didn't ask anybody to go in, they just, I know, I know, I know, it's Very crazy stories. And the Rebbe Rashab was involved in all of this, in this kind of askanis. But I want to speak about one thing particularly, which I think is important for you to hear. The Rebbe Rashab was a real radical. He was a kanoi. The Rebbe Rashab was into Yiddishkeit without any pshadas whatsoever. And when you look, you juxtapose the Rebbe Rashab in the early years of the Friedrich Rebbe against the Friedrich Rebbe in America and our Rebbe, you cannot believe that these men are really a succession, that it's the same movement because it's, it's so different. The Rebbe Rashab was incredibly dogmatic. He spoke very much a language of us and them. Very much a language of us and them. Us was Haredim, Haredim didn't mean from. Haredim meant far from, radical from. And the Rebbe Rashab had an allergy to anybody who in any way had modern ideas, even if they were from, let alone if they had modern ideas and they weren't so from, or they weren't from at all. And he took very, very strong positions in many, many cases, not to let Yiddishkeit and Russia change an iota. And he fought and he fought and he fought and he fought so many battles. And when you look at it now, what you see in hindsight, some people will say he failed. And other people say he was doing a holding pattern. He was just delaying. The changes that were happening in the world, I hate to say it, they were going to happen because they were not being done by the Rebbe Rashab or by some Freya Yidin or done by the Eivishter. But the attitude that the Rebbe Rashab took was, we're going to hold on to the old-fashioned Yiddish, we're not going to budge from it. <coughs> when we came to America, and Lubavitch was de- known as the biggest kanoi, the biggest radicals, the Rebbe Rashab, and the Munka Rebbe, and I, I don't mean to put this person in the same sentence, but you'll give an idea. The Satma Rebbe, he was much younger. They were radicals. They were radicals. And then you come to America, and the Friedrich Rebbe and the Rebbe, they didn't change the position a little bit. They changed, they did a 180, legamera different. Every Jew is good. You have to embrace every year, you have to embrace every year, you have to be makar of every year. The change is, un, is mamish extreme. But I will tell you without having time to explain it, that if you look closely enough and deeply enough, you'll actually see that the shitas are consistent. The, the, what changed is not the Rebbe, what changed is the situation on the ground. The Rebbe Rashab's position was, we're holding on to what we have at all costs. The Rebbe and the Firika's position is, there's nothing to hold on to. So you got to start over. But the Rebbe Rashab was really dogmatic about not letting go of the old ways. And of all the G'dayim in Russia, he, again, I'm using this word not because I, I, I really think it's that primary, but it makes sense. He was the most satmed. <laughs> I'm only saying it because you relate to that idea. He was the most dogmatic about not making any changes in Yiddishkeit in Russia, in any area. He fought against everything, even from Zionists and all kinds of from movements which were springing up in Russia that had the slightest traits of modernism that Rebbe Rashab wanted to do with him. Okay, I gotta run because uh, I gotta run. Okay, well, that might have now, yeah? Yeah.